what is libel? Libel laws are classified as crimes against honor, which seek to protect an individual against unjust attacks against the character and reputation of his person. Article 353 of the Revised Penal Code provides that libel is a public and malicious imputation of a crime or of a vice or a defect, real or imaginary, or any act, omission, condition, status, or circumstance tending to cause the dishonor, discredit, or contempt of a natural or juridical person or to blacken the memory of one who is dead. Article 354 of the same code presumes malice as a general rule in every defamatory imputation without regard to its truth or falsity. What are the essential elements of libel? There are four essential elements of libel. First, the imputation must be defamatory. Second, the imputation must be malicious. Third, the imputation must be made publicly. And finally, the person defamed must be identifiable. Noticeably absent from the enumeration is the requirement of falsity. Instead of falsity, Philippine law only requires that the defamatory imputation is malicious. Where one element is missing, the libel action should be dismissed. What is cyber libel? In 2012, the Cyber Crime Prevention Act introduced the concept of cyber libel. Cyber libel is libel committed through a computer system or any other similar means that may be devised in the future. The difference between these specific categories of criminal defamation lies mainly in the medium of communication because the manner in which they are committed is generally similar. If it is cyber libel, then the penalty is increased by one degree. Thus, the penalty is prison mayor in its minimum period, which is from six years and one day to eight years, and medium period, which is from eight years and one day to ten years. Can an offender be prosecuted under the cyber libel and libel under the revised penal code? No. The Supreme Court declared that there can be no two prosecutions of libel under the revised penal code and online libel under RA 10175, for such constitutes a violation of the prescription against double jeopardy. When a published material on print is said to be libelous and again posted online or vice versa, that identical material cannot be subject of two separate charges for libel. The two offenses, one a violation of the RPC and the other a violation of RA 10175, involve essentially the same elements and are in fact one and the same offense. Online libel refers to the means of publication, which is through the computer system. What are the means by which libel is committed? Libel is committed not only by writing, but also through printing, lithography, engraving, radio, phonograph, painting, theatrical exhibition, cinematographic exhibition, or any similar means. How about if the defamatory imputation is done through television? Is defamation made in a television program considered libel? Yes. Defamation made in a television program is libel. While the medium of television is not expressly mentioned among the means specified in the law, it easily qualifies under the general provision or any other similar means. What are the rules to determine whether a language is defamatory or not? First, consider the matter conveyed to a fair and reasonable man and not the intention of the author or the accused. Second, statements should not be interpreted by taking the words one by one out of context. They must be taken in their entirety. And finally, words are to be given the ordinary meaning as are commonly understood and accepted in the daily life. The technical meanings do not apply.
This is especially true to idiomatic sayings. For example, babae ng bayan does not mean a heroine or hayok sa laman does not mean a meat eater. What is covered under defamatory imputation? The imputation can cover any of the following. First, crime allegedly committed by the offended party. Second, vice or defect which is real or imaginary of the offended party. Or, any act, omission, condition, status of, circumstance relating to the offended party which tend to cause the dishonor, discredit, or contempt of a natural or juridical person or to blacken the memory of one who is dead. Here is an example of an imputation of a crime allegedly committed by the offended party. An article which portrays the offended party as a swindler who, prior to his election as municipal president, collected money from several inhabitants of the town through fraud and deceit and constructed a house with the money so collected. So what is the crime imputed here? It is the commission of the crime of estafa to the offended party. Another example is branding somebody as having murdered his brother-in-law or enriching himself at the expense of others who trusted him or calling one a bigamist and becoming rich overnight through transactions which are questionable and influence peddling or winning in an election through mass fraud and rampant vote buying. These are obviously slanderous and libelous imputations. These are malicious imputations of criminal acts tending to cause dishonor, discredit, and contempt of the complainant, which is punishable under Article 353 of the RPC. Now let's go to an example of imputation of a vice or defect. When a person in an article imputes upon the persons mentioned therein lascivious and immoral habits, that article is of a libelous nature as it tends to discredit the persons libeled in the minds of those reading the said article. Another example is calling complainant who was a barangay captain, ignoramus, traitor, tyrant, and Judas is clearly an imputation of defects in complainant's character, sufficient to cause him embarrassment and social humiliation. Now, what about when A calls C an adulteress? Can this be covered under defamatory imputation? Will it be under a crime or a vice or defect? In Gonzalez v. Arcilia, the court ruled that one who grubs another husband does not necessarily mean an adulteress. At most, it may imply that the person to whom it is addressed is a flirt, a temptress, or one who indulges in enticing other husbands. Hence, it is more of an imputation of a vice, condition, or act not constituting a crime. What is an example of an imputation of an act or omission? When an article signed by the accused and published in the Philippines Herald says that the offended party used to borrow money without intention to pay or that he ordered the fixing of his teeth without paying the fees for the services rendered by the dentist, this contains imputation of an act and omission which is defamatory. What about Imputation of a condition, status, or circumstance. Writing and publishing an article containing the words coward, vile soul, dirty soccer, savage, hog who always looks toward the ground. These expose the party to public contempt and ridicule. Thus, these are defamatory imputations. How about when A refers to C as crazy? Is that a defamatory imputation? Well, it depends. The word fool or crazy becomes defamatory if used to connote mental aberration. Now let us go to the second element. What constitutes publication? Publication is the communication of the defamatory matter to some third person or persons. Libel is published not only when it is widely circulated, but also when it is made known or brought to the attention or notice of another person other than the author and the offended party. For example, 
writing a letter to another person other than the person defamed is sufficient to constitute publication. For the person to whom the letter is addressed is a third person in relation to its writer and the person defamed therein. Another example is sending to the wife a letter defamatory of her husband, which is sufficient publication. The person defamed is the husband and the wife is a third person to whom the publication is made. Let us jump to the third requisite, malice. What is malice and how is it proved? Malice is a term used to indicate the fact that the offender is prompted by personal ill will or spite and speaks not in response to duty but merely to endure the reputation of the person defamed. In a libel case, it consists in unintentionally publishing without justifiable cause any written or printed matter which is injurious to the character of another. There are two types of malice, malice in law and malice in fact. Malice in law is a presumption of law. It dispenses with the proof of malice when words which raise the presumption are shown to have been uttered. It is also known as constructive malice or legal malice or implied malice. On the other hand, malice in fact is a positive desire and intention to annoy or injure the other person. It may denote that the defendant was actuated by ill will or personal spite. It is also called express malice or actual malice, real malice, true malice, or particular malice. Malice is proved or established either by presumption or by proof. Philippine law presumes that every defamatory imputation is malicious even if it be true, if no good intention and justifiable motive for making it is shown. Truth or falsity is generally immaterial in a defamation suit because Philippine defamation law does not seek to punish the act of lying or telling mistruths about the others. Instead, its primary purpose is to uphold a person's right to public esteem by preventing injury to reputation. The offender has the burden to show that he has good intentions and a proper motive in making the imputation. Nevertheless, the rule recognizes two exceptions. First, a private communication made by any person to another in the performance of any legal, moral, or social duty. And a fair and true report made in good faith without any comments or remarks of any judicial legislative, or other official proceedings which are not of confidential nature or of any statement, report, or speech delivered in said proceedings or of any other act performed by public officers in the exercise of their functions. An example of a fair and true report made in good faith is when the heading or title of a news item merely portrayed with accuracy what was in the news item. The heading of the news item arising from the testimony of Jaime Jose that was worded, Link Crisologo's son to Pasay rape case, is not enough to be considered defamation as it was to portray with accuracy what was contained in the news item. It succinctly set forth the facts and there was no attempt to sensationalize. The tone is both neutral and objective. Further, a newspaper's faithful and accurate summary of what was testified to by a witness in a pending rape case is not libelous. Remember, in matters of libel, the question is not what the writer of an alleged libel means, but what is the meaning of the words he has used. The meaning of the writer is quite immaterial. The question is not what the writer meant, but what his words conveyed to those who heard or read them. It is not the intention of the speaker or writer or the understanding of the plaintiff or of any hearer or reader by which the actionable quality of the words is to be determined, but the meaning that the words in fact conveyed on the minds of persons of reasonable understanding, discretion, and candor, taking into consideration the surrounding circumstances which were known to the hearer or reader. Let's go to the fourth element. Should the person defamed be identifiable? Yes. 
in order to maintain a libel suit, it is essential that the victim be identifiable, although it is not necessary that he be named. It is enough if by intrinsic reference the allusion is apparent or if the publication contains matters of description or reference to facts and circumstances from which others who reading the article may know that the plaintiff was intended, or if he is pointed out by extraneous circumstances so that the persons knowing him could and did understand that he was the person referred to. The obnoxious writing did not mention the libeled party by name. It is sufficient if it is shown that the offended party is the person meant or alluded to. The prosecution being permitted to prove by evidence that the vague imputation refers to the complainant. However, where no one is named or accurately described in the article complained of, it is not sufficient that the offended party recognized himself as the person attacked or defamed. It must be shown that at least a third person could identify him as the object of the libelous publication. Where the article is impersonal on its face and interpretation of its language does not single out individuals, the fourth essential requisite of the offense of libel does not exist. How about orally? Can libel be committed orally? Oral defamation is punished under Article 358 of the Revised Penal Code. Oral defamation, or more commonly known as slander, is basically libel committed verbally instead of in writing. The key factor is whether the speech tends to harm one's reputation, office, trade, business, or means of livelihood. What are other prohibited acts concerning libel? Under Article 356 of the Revised Penal Code, the penalty of arresto mayor or a fine from 200 pesos to 2,000 pesos or both shall be imposed upon any person who threatens another to publish a libel concerning him or the parents, spouse, child, or other members of the family of the latter, or upon anyone who shall offer to prevent the publication of such libel for a compensation or money consideration. This is also referred to as blackmailing. Also, under Article 357 of the Revised Penal Code, the penalty of arresto mayor or a fine of 20 pesos to 2,000 pesos or both shall be imposed upon any reporter, editor, or manager of a newspaper, daily, or magazine who shall publish facts connected with the private life of another and offensive to the honor, virtue, and reputation of said person, even though said publication be made in connection with or under the pretext that it is necessary in the narration of any judicial or administrative proceedings wherein such facts have been mentioned. Let's go to the possible defenses in an action for libel. First, privileged communications. Privileged communications are those which, were it not for the occasion on which or the circumstances under which they are made, would be derogatory and actionable. Second, fair comment on matters of public interest. A matter of public interest is a common property, and hence, anybody may express an opinion on it. Thus, it is a defense to an action for libel or slander that the words complained of are actually fair comment on a matter of public interest. Third, fair comment on qualifications of candidates for public office. However, if it appears that it was actuated by actual or express malice and is defamatory in nature, then the comment or criticism constitutes libel since the freedom to such criticism is limited to fair comment. Next, apology or retraction. A retraction published to correct the mistake does not wipe out the responsibility arising from the publication of the libelous article, although it may and should mitigate it. However, a publication of a retraction or apology on an agreement with the injured party that the aforesaid publication shall constitute a complete accord and satisfaction will bar the right of plaintiff to an action for damages. Next, rectification. Rectification 
a clarification does not wipe out the responsibilities arising from the publication of the first article, although it may and should mitigate it. Next, proof of truth. Proof of truth is not enough to acquit the offender. It is also required that the matter charged as libelous was published with good motives and for justifiable ends. And finally, self-defense. To justify one's hitting back with another libel, there must be a showing that he has been libeled. Who are the persons responsible in a libel case? Any person who shall publish, exhibit, or cause the publication or exhibition of any defamation in writing or by similar means shall be responsible for the same. The author or editor of a book or pamphlet or the editor or business manager of a daily newspaper, magazine, or serial publication shall be responsible for the defamations contained therein to the same extent as if he were the author of the same. Proprietors and editors of periodicals are also responsible for the appearance of defamatory matter contained therein, as likewise are all persons who actually participate in the publication of such matter. It is not necessary that the libelous matter should have been seen or read by another, as it is sufficient that the accused knowingly parted with the immediate custody thereof under circumstances which exposed it to be read or seen by a person other than himself. In the case of cyber libel, the Supreme Court ruled that there must be a law expressly punishing the act for those that share, retweet, like, or comment on a libelous post to be liable in the same manner as the original author. In the Philippines, what affects our defamation standards? First, freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is codified under Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. Second, jurisdiction over non-resident defendants. Philippine courts cannot charge non-resident defendants with criminal defamation. Third, corporations cannot be charged with criminal defamation. And finally, the statute of limitations for libel is only one year and six months for slander. Let's go to some bar questions on libel. Suppose Z, a reporter of a certain daily newspaper known as Bulalakaw, published an article concerning an account of a successful raid by two police officers upon a gambling den and the arrest of several people. The article also stated that a certain Madam X, who is the complainant, was among the persons arrested and that her name was stricken from the information. It turned out that the complainant was neither caught, arrested, nor prosecuted. Hence, she instituted an action for libel against Z. Will the charge against Z prosper? Answer, no. The charge of libel will not prosper. As long as the publicist of the news item was not prompted by ill will or spite as there was no intention to do harm, libel will not prosper because of the absence of malice. In Kisumbing v. Lopez, the Supreme Court held that newspapers should be given such leeway and tolerance so as to enable them to courageously and effectively perform their important role in our democracy. In the preparation of stories, press reporters and editors usually have to race with their deadlines, and consistently with good faith and reasonable care, they should not be held to account to a point for suppression for honest mistakes or imperfections in the choice of words. The ruling in the case of U.S. versus Bostos is more to the point, where it was held that even when the statements are found to be false, if there is probable cause for belief in their truthfulness and the charge is made in good faith, the mantle of privilege may still cover the mistake of the individual. As long as good faith exists, then libel cannot prosper. The next scenario. A caused the publication in a newspaper of a news item wherein A stated that B had cheated him in a business deal and that the public was being warned against entering into any transaction with B. The latter countered with a subsequent press release in the same newspaper to the effect that A's allegations were not true and that A was a liar, 
because it was A himself who cheated B. The fiscal charged both A and B in separate informations for libel upon the complaint of B and the countercharge of A. Decide with reasons. Answer. B's complaint should be sustained. His press release stating that the allegations of A that B cheated him in a business deal is not true and that A was a liar as it was A who cheated him, although it is defamatory in character, it is a fair and adequate answer to the libel uttered by A and is necessarily related to the imputation made by A. B only made an explanation and in doing so uttered it in the same language that A did. This is self-defense in libel as the utterance is not excessive but adequate to repel the sting of the aspersion cast upon him by A. Next, Romeo Cunanan, publisher of the Baguio Daily, was sued by Pedro Aguas for libel for the publication of his picture with the notice that this is to inform the public that Pedro Aguas, whose picture appears above, has ceased to be connected with the Sincere Insurance Company as underwriter as of December 31, 1987. Any transaction entered into by him after said date will not be honored. Is the publication defamatory? Explain briefly. Answer. No. In libel, the imputation must be malicious. The publication is not defamatory because the element of intent to defame is absent. This is a mere announcement and does not carry any implication. Next question. During a seminar workshop attended by government employees from the Bureau of Customs and the Bureau of Internal Revenue, A. The speaker, in the course of his lecture, lamented the fact that a great majority of those serving in said agencies were utterly dishonest and corrupt. The following morning, the whole group of employees from the two bureaus who attended the seminar as complainants filed a criminal complaint against A for uttering what the group claimed to be defamatory statements of the lecturer. In court, A filed a motion to quash the information reciting fully the above facts on the ground that no crime were committed. If you were the judge, how would you resolve the motion? Answer. I would grant the motion to quash on the ground that the facts charged do not constitute an offense, since there is no definite person or persons dishonored in the crime of libel or slander. The person or persons dishonored must be identifiable even by innuendos. Otherwise, the crime against honor is not committed. Moreover, A was not making a malicious imputation but was merely stating an opinion. He was delivering lecture with no malice at all during a seminar workshop. Malice being inherently absent in the utterance, then the statement is not actionable as defamatory. Here is another bar exam question. In the course of proceeding during a so-called public hearing held before a crowd, in a place open to the public, the leaders of the meeting tried certain public officials and thereafter sentenced them to death by assassination or ambuscades. Are the leaders criminally liable? Decide the case. Answer. Yes, the leaders are criminally liable for the crime of libel by theatrical exhibition. Article 355 of the Revised Penal Code provides, libel by means of writing or similar means. A libel committed by means of writing, printing, lithography, engraving, radio, phonographs, painting, theatrical exhibition, cinematographic exhibition, or any similar means shall be punished by prison correctional. In this case, the act of the leaders of the meeting constitutes theatrical exhibition. Now let's go down to our last scenario, but this time on cyber libel. One day, Maria posts on her internet account the statement that a certain married public official has an illicit affair with a movie star. Linda, one of Maria's friends who sees this post, comments online, Yes, this is so true. They are so immoral. Maria's original post 
is then multiplied by her friends and the latter's friends, and down the line to friends of friends almost ad infinitum. Nana, who is a stranger to both Maria and Linda, comes across this blog, finds it interesting, and so shares the link to this apparently defamatory blog on her Twitter account. Nana's followers then retweet the link to that blog site. Pamela, a Twitter user, stumbles upon a random person's retweet of Nana's original tweet and posts this on her Facebook account. Immediately, Pamela's Facebook friends start liking and making comments on the assailed posting. A lot of them even press the share button, resulting in the further spread of the original posting into tens, hundreds, thousands, and greater postings. Are online postings, such as liking an openly defamatory statement, commenting on it, or sharing it with others to be regarded as aiding or abetting? Answer? No. The Supreme Court has previously ruled that this class of interaction in social media will not give rise to liability for cyber libel. First, there is no law punishing such act. In the absence of legislation expressly prohibiting such activity, there could be no crime. Second, the laws on libel punishes only the author of the post or editor. Clearly, the person liking or sharing is not the author of the original post. The court also held that these acts are essentially knee-jerk reactions or sentiments of the users towards the post, and who may think little or haphazardly or of their response to the original posting. They are merely reacting to the post or expressing their agreement with the statement of the original author. Quite clearly, they would not, in any way, be considered the author of the post that they are liking or sharing or retweeting or commenting on. The original author is and will always be the originator or person who started it all. Music